couple of weeks ago, I had a group of our, um, uh, our communicators, our other preachers, and we went down into Brisbane, and uh, we went to hang out at another church on a Sunday night. That's not giving you an, uh, an out to try somewhere else. No, I'm kidding. Um, we went down to go and learn, go and be with them, go listen to their preaching, go learn from them as a church. And afterwards, I was like, hey, there's this burger place that's really good nearby. Let's go try it. And so we go in, we order. I've been there before. Not many other people have been there before. So I went in and I'm like, okay, get all your stuff. And we sit down and I'm like, this is going to be great. And then we start to eat and I'm just like, something's wrong. Something doesn't taste right. It's not the same as it was before. I don't remember it being this, this dry. So we're very polite, right? We're Christians. So we're sitting there polite, quietly, eating our food, talking about debriefing. We could take this idea. We could take that idea. I love that spirit. I, would, I don't know if I would do it that way. And so it was a very cordial conversation. And then these other couple came in, these other couple guys, and they ordered. They sat down, and they started to eat. And I was like, maybe it's just me. Maybe my expectation was like last time I was super hungry and I came and it was amazing. And so this time it's not very good. And they sat down and then they were a lot more Australian and a lot more ochre and a lot more rat's tail. And it was awesome. And so they were like, they were like, "Uh, excuse me, we have a problem. It's just not the same. And the person came over and was like, they're like, it's the same recipe? It's like, yes. Is it the same chef? Yes. He goes, it's not the same. It's not. It's not as juicy. It's not as good. And then they walked away. It's like, someone's going to tell them. Otherwise, they won't know. Like, how have we been out and post people? So we sat there. The expectation and the reality, I felt so justified in that moment. I was like, yes, I can trust my taste buds again. Um, but my expectation was like, I'm going to have this juicy, I've saved my food all day. I'm ready to eat this thing. It is going to be the best. My expectation was this, and my reality was this. It didn't measure up. There was a gap between my expectation and my reality. Now, I would say when we come to our Father God or our fathers in life, our expectation can be up here, but then our realities often will end up like here. Why? Because people aren't perfect. Because humanity is not perfect. We are broken humans. Uh, and, and I think a lot of dads are trying their best, but there's ways I could probably speak to myself even. There's times where I'll let my family down because I am human. So what is the expectation? Well, the expectation is set by our Father in heaven. And who is he? Who is he? He would be this archetype. If you're taking notes, write this down. He is the faithful Father. That's who our God is. So John 3, 16 and 17 says this, and you might know it. Read along with me. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. The Father loved us when we couldn't do anything to merit it, to earn it, to get it back. He is faithful. He's extravagant. He's a protector, a provider, a teacher, a friend, a confidant, a maker, a financier. You think the job you have is because of your design? No, it's because of a good father who is faithful, who's made a way for you to do that. Who gave you, who knit you together in your mother's womb. Oh, I did this myself. It's my intellect. It's me, 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 my, 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 my. No, I'm sorry. It's his. Your crafted workmanship of a God who loves you. He is faithful. Faithful means he's loyal and he's steadfast. And I think in life, that's what we want to order, right? We all want to experience the faithful father. We all want to have that in the natural. We all want to have that in around our world, but is it what we received? Our expectation is one way. Our reality is the other way. And maybe you had the most, maybe, maybe your father figure was nothing like that at all. Zero percent, okay? And I'm so sorry that has been your reality. But maybe for many of us, your father was like 80% there or 90% there. And so what is that gap? If we could just talk to a couple of things that live in that gap, maybe different versions of a father that we have felt in our world that I believe God wants to bring healing to today. Maybe you experience the forgetful father. Taking notes, write that down. The forgetful father. Has anyone ever been left behind somewhere? Oh, yeah. Hands up. Oh, yeah. Left behind. Um, I think, I think this probably doesn't happen as much to firstborn children because parents, because parents are on 
eggshells and they're just learning to become parents. And so everything is like helicopter. They'll be just over there and you're like chup, 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 watching them. You know, second children, third children, fourth children. I'm, I'm the fifth child. So by then, good luck, buddy. You're on your own. I got left behind at church a couple times. Here's how the conversation would go. Ryan, are you going with mom? Yes. Ryan, are you going with dad? Yes. And then they both leave. And so I'm at church being like, can someone drop me home? Can someone come back? And no mobile phones, 88. So it's like we're waiting for the drive, waiting there in the heat. It was awesome. So we kind of know how that feels like to be left behind sometimes. And that's a funny example. But sometimes that 10% gap of being forgotten, even if it wasn't intentional, even if they didn't mean it, even if they love you with all their heart, your parents and your father figure in your world would die for you. But there could be something that they've just forgotten one time. It can create this little trauma nick in your soul. This little thing that would be like, oh, they forgot this, or they forgot that, or they forgot this time, or they forgot that. Does my father in heaven forget me? And the way that we experience life can then come down to the way we then look at the Father God. And I don't know what your experience has been, but here is the truth. No matter your story, the forgetful Father is not the story that God is telling. Psalm 139 verse 17 and 18 says this. It says, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand, and I awake, and I am still with you. Come on, the Bible says he knows the number of hairs on your head, that he thinks about you constantly, that you are his apple of his eye. That is the Father in heaven. He is not the forgetful Father. He is the faithful Father. That's who he is. And the encouragement to the room would be, hey, if you're a dad in the room, come on, let's be faithful. If we had moments where we have forgotten things or whatever else, we all know we're trying hard. This is not a shaming message. This is to help us aspire to be the men that God's called us to be. The forgetful father. What about this one? Maybe you have got, uh, maybe the expectation was faithful, but the reality that you felt was the foreign father. Distant. Uh, have you ever experienced culture shock? Have you ever been somewhere where you were like, maybe even in church? Church can create culture shock for people because they've never been in the culture before. So it's like, it's a, it's a, we do what? Um, they do what meals for people who have babies? Um, you had that conversation at work before. What do you mean people came around and cleaned your house? What do you mean they did your yard? What do you mean someone calls you? What, I don't understand. What do you mean someone did? There's a culture shock there. But I experienced culture shock when I've been on a few uh, trips to go visit our global partners. Um, there's nothing like culture shock when you go to a toilet in Northern Asia. That's culture shock, particularly if you haven't done enough squats before you leave. And you walk in and you're like, where's the toilet? And there's a drain. And you're like, well, that's normal. That's great. Culture shock. Or when you get served up a dish that is questionable at best as to what type of protein you are eating, considering there are donkeys outside and nothing else. Are we eating donkey? Okay, yes, we are eating donkey. And what part of the donkey? And at that point, our global partner says, you don't want to know. You don't know what one part of the donkey that you are eating. You must be polite, so eat it. Culture shock. We feel foreign. It feels strange, doesn't it? It feels a bit weird. And sometimes I think in life that we can experience that too when it comes to our father or father figures, a little bit distant, a little bit foreign, that they're not so close as what they have been before. Sometimes that can be our, our story. Have you ever thought about Jesus? Have you ever thought about Jesus being born? Okay, he wasn't Joseph's biological son. So Joseph, in essence, was a little bit of a stepdad figure, but a stepdad figure who fully embraced Jesus as his own, fully made him like his firstborn, fully embraced him as a son in that respect. So, he, so Joseph knows what it's like as, as, the, as not the not biological father of Jesus, because it had nothing to do with it, but the stepdad of Jesus to take and to, to still feel that sense of, hey, he's mine under my covering, but I still feel distance there. And how do I parent him? How do I lead Jesus? How do I do that? He understands what it's like to be foreign in that way. And maybe in your world, you've ever experienced a foreign type of father figure. 
Maybe even in the room today, you're like, Ryan, yeah, but I'm the dad and I feel foreign to my family because I have to provide, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to travel and work, and I just want to be there, but life's so challenging, I just can't be there. And I, this is, again, not a message to shame you. Hey, we're meeting with you out and inspiring us to be. Let's not be. Let's make the moments when we are home to be the most incredible moments our family remember. Let's, let's be the dads that he's calling us to be. That's the message today, Okay. I'm clarifying because I need to. But all I want to say to us is that our God is the faithful Father. He's not forgetful. He's not foreign. This is who He is. 2 Corinthians 5.18. It says to us, All this from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Connection, right? That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting us to the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled with God. The scripture tells us that we are part of the family of God. That we don't have to be foreign to God as a father. We can, we're part of his family, ambassadors of Christ through the finished work of what Jesus has done for us. Maybe your reality was something foreign, but doesn't have to be with God the Father. That's not who he is. That's not who he is. So what is he? When we look at the Father, then how do we go deeper? Well, then to understand that, we've got to look at what's in his heart. Let's look at the Father heart of God. And I found some amazing authors, uh, pastors, and fathers, and a few of their sayings, so you can read them along with me because their words are powerful and profound. Charles Spurgeon says, God's fatherly heart is a well of love, ever flowing, inexhaustible, always fresh and springing up. What about A.W. Tozer? He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It's a little bit telling. The Father heart of God yearns over His children. He is far too wise to make any mistakes and far too loving to be unkind. C.S. Lewis says, when we say Father to God, we open ourselves up to His nurturing, His guiding and protective care. His fatherhood is the pattern for all true fatherhood and His Father heart, we find our security. Pastor Bill Johnson says, the Father heart is to love us as we are but also help us to become all that He knows we can be. His love is tr- transforming, not just affirming. Author Tim Keller says, the only person who dares to wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. We have that kind of access to God because of His Father heart. Philip Yancey says this, God loves us because of who we are. Not because of who we are, but because of who He is. The Father heart of God can take even the messes we make of our lives and turn them into something beautiful. 1 John 3, 1. What does the Word say? See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that they did not know Him. So what, it comes, what does it come down to? We're looking at the Father, heart of God. I want you to embrace the love of the Father. There's the trick answer right there. What is in the Father's heart towards us today? It's a four-letter word, love. It's love. There's nothing like the love of Father God. He forgave us our wrong and reconciled ourselves back to Him. That ministry of reconciliation so that we can extend that to other people as well. You know, Luke 15 has been a pretty incredible p- passage of Scripture for us as a church this year. We have declared prophetically in, into uh, our church that it's a year of harvest and homecoming, a year where people would come home to Jesus or come back to Him for the first time. And Luke 15 tells this story of the prodigal son, the son who, who comes to his father and says, Hey, I want my inheritance now. Give it to me now. Have you ever stopped to think as to why the son did that? What was his father like? The Bible doesn't tell us. It doesn't say if he was a good father, if he was a faithful father. It just tells you that the reaction of the son, which was the wrong thing, was the reaction. But maybe there was a gap in his natural father-likeness as well as to why the son would come and say, hey, give it to me now, I want out of here. So the son takes it, does the wrong thing, sins against his father, because you're not supposed to do that goes off into another land and wastes all of his inheritance on reckless living. 
winds up in the pig pen, in the mess of all messes, and has to then come to his senses and realize, hey, even the servants in my father's house have better food than this. And what I love in this picture for us as a church is there is not one person in God's church who has not been in the pig pen. We all, but by the grace of God, are in relationship with Jesus. We all have had a moment where we've gone, hey, I don't know if I want my knees up, like, up to my knees in pig poo anymore. I don't know if I want to deal with the stuff that I have embraced in my life. I don't know. And if we come to our senses, we're like, but the mess, does God, does the Father know the mess I'm leaving behind? Does He know the empty bottles at home? Does He know the addiction that's on my computer? Does He know the amount of people I've slept with? Does He know the money that I stole? Does He know all, like all the mess, I just, and then we do this, I just got to clean the pig pen up and then I'll go home. I won't come to church because the pig pen is just not clean enough yet. And so when I can clean this pig slop off me and get all the smell off me, have you ever smelt a pig in Vietnam? Oh my gosh. That's a smell. I mean, they smell here, but they smell there, I'm telling you. That is, that type of stench, that would stay on you. It's in that state. It's in that feeling that you can't get it off yourself. That he goes and he comes to his senses and he says, I'm going to go back to my father's house. I'm not going to live this way anymore. And what does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us in Luke 15, and he arose and came to his father, but still he, but he was still a long way off, and his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. Kissed him when he smelt like pig. Kissed him after he'd been traveling for days. Kissed him in the most disgusting version of himself. Wasn't like, hey, go wash and go get yourself clean and do all this stuff. No, 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 no. Even when he was addicted, looking at stuff, lost, hurting, broken, come here, I love you. Come here, I want you. You're finally home. And then what does he say to his servants? He then says, and he says, the father said to him, I've sinned against you and heaven before you, the son, and I'm no longer to be called your son. Hey, ask for forgiveness. I've done the wrong thing. But the father said to his servants, see, he didn't even address the son yet. He says, hey, even in your mess, even in your smell, even in the stuff that you've walked out of, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Shower first. Be in church for six months. No, 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 bring it now. Go get the robe. Go get the thing. Invite him in right now. Put the ring on his hands and the shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf. You know that one we were keeping? Let's eat and celebrate because my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found and they began to celebrate. That's the father heart of God on display. That's the love of the father right there, church. So how do we get that? Well, the key is in the scripture there. It's this big word that's super powerful. The key to unlock that door to the Father, heart of God is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is the key to experience the love of the Father in two ways, right? The first way is that we have to accept forgiveness. We get to be a part of God's story when we accept the finished work of Jesus. Period. There's no other way to getting to the Father but through the Son. There's no other way. You can manifest whatever you want. You can get into the new age. You can do this stuff, blah, 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 blah. There's no other way but through Jesus. He is the only way. And we have to accept the forgiveness that he has extended through us, that God sent his son Jesus for us to die on our behalf, that when we're in the pig pen, that we get to come home. That is why it's called the gospel, the good news, because it is absolutely ridiculous. Everything in our own world would say, oh, you've got to earn it, you've got to do whatever. You have to make sure you can do it all before you get to live in that space. No, that's this thing called forgiveness, that while we were still a long way off, while we smelt, while we were so distant, while we were still addicted, while we still had stuff in our system and came to church, he loves us. And we, would, he, would we accept that forgiveness? Would we accept that forgiveness? I think there's some people in the room who 
Maybe even yourself, you haven't accepted that forgiveness of yourself. That Jesus, yes, has forgiven you through his finished work on the cross. But that story ruminates in your mind. That even last night as you're going to sleep, the words that were coming over you just, what do you think, who do you think you are going to church tomorrow? Are you kidding me? If they only knew. And the response is, yeah, but I've got Jesus. Yeah, they can know all this stuff. Because even in that stuff, he came for me. He died for me. He loved me so much because he's indivisible from the Father. They share the same heart. The heart is love. We have to accept that forgiveness. And here's the really challenging invitation, right? We then have to extend that forgiveness. We've got to get it, and we've got to give it. Matthew 6 is one of the most frightening scriptures ever. Jesus' words, not mine. It says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 15, But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Can I just say, forgiveness doesn't mean that there's not justice. It doesn't mean vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He's God and He's not going to be mocked. Forgiveness, what it does is it releases you from the stronghold in your life. It detaches you and shuts the door from the things that are counterfeit and it opens you up to the truth and the reality of who God is. That's what forgiveness does. Forgiveness will help you to embrace the love of the Father. You know, today uh, I, I have a beautiful family. I'm a very, very blessed man. I have three beautiful girls. Uh, my wife, Letitia, took a photo of me yesterday in bed with them just covered on me. After a late night seeing people come to know Jesus at Wonder World, our youth was there, it was awesome. And the next morning, I could barely open my eyes and like, boom, 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 like they're all in there. And I was just like, oh my gosh. I'm blessed. I know that. But I think the thing is for me as a dad, I know that I'm still human. I know there'll be stuff in their life that they are going to have to forgive me for. Okay, even though I'm trying my best, even though I love them with all my heart, even though I would die for them, honestly, even, even if they could take all my money, take everything away, I don't care, just for them to be okay. Even though I love them so much in my humanity, I cannot be the faithful father. And I'm just thankful that there is a God in heaven who can show them what a faithful father is. I'm just thankful that, hey, when I mess up and when I don't measure up and when I'm not good enough because that's the way of my humanity, that there is a God in heaven who is faithful, who gets to be a picture of what they can ultimately have. And my job as their dad is to help to reflect that is to help to reflect that, is to own my stuff when I don't measure up, is to, to, to nail that down when I'm like 60%, 50% of the dad I want to be and to help them see, hey, but that's not what God's really like. Help me to show you the Father. Help me to give you the right picture. And there's going to come a moment where I know they are going to have to forgive me. They're going to have to extend forgiveness. 